Sorry I'm a few minutes late. Uh, I just realized what time it was. Uh, I'm also expecting a package, so expect there might be a doorbell going off and I might have to run and get it because it's liquor and I need to sign for it. So uh, welcome. I'm glad you could join me for Instagram Live today. Apero Hour, yeah. <laughs> I miss you. Uh, my friend Marion Cunningham, who wrote the Fanny Farmer Baking Book and the Fanny Farmer Cookbook and was from many different, a few generations ago, well, maybe one generation ago, she once said to me, she goes, you know, everybody says they're so busy all the time. She's like, what is everybody doing that makes them so busy? And I kind of realized the other day, well, she didn't have to like deal with, uh, there wasn't like social media, she didn't have a blog, um, but where she, there, was a, there weren't all these websites that make you sign in like five times and remember all these passwords and create new passwords and change them and so forth. So, um, so I've been kind of busy and I've been um, out and about. And for those people that um, keep writing, hello Maggie, how are you? And hello in Switzerland again. Um, you wrote again, so I'm saying, okay, welcome back. Um, hi, in Brooklyn. And someone said, I'm a kind spirit. Uh, well, somebody yesterday on Facebook didn't think so, but that's okay. They said they weren't gonna toast me. Um, <laughs> okay, and hello in Rhode Island. Um, I love that you can drive across Rhode Island in 30 minutes. Um, so for those of you that are trying to keep track of me, the other reason I was late was because I finally got fitted with a tracking device. I'm wearing it on my foot, you can see it. Um, I'm gonna introduce, there's gonna be a code that you can enter into your telephone if you download the app and you'll be able to track my every move. Um, I'm probably gonna turn it off after 11 p.m. because sometimes I get up in the middle of the night to um, do what men over 50 do <laughs> and women who have had children <laughs> and the rest of us. But um, that's, that's it, I got my ankle bracelet. Um, it was, well, I won't make a joke about that because um, then I'll have to actually get the app going and so that's it's not really gonna happen. <laughs> I, thought, I thought that would be it. Um, before I start, um, I've got a couple of announcements to make. Um, one is I'm, hap I'm very happy to see you. I think I already said that. Hello in Jackson Heights. No, not really a tracking app. Yes, find my David. <laughs> Wouldn't that be nice? <laughs> Well, not for me, but for everybody. Um, just to, before I get going, um, Saturday, I'm gonna be on um, a, not a Zoom, but an online live presentation with my good friend, Reem Cassis. And she wrote this wonderful book on Palestinian food, which is how I got to meet her. And she just came out with this new book called The Arabesque Table. And yes, the title is backwards because the camera is in the selfie mode and you're seeing everything backwards. Um, however, um, we won't be in the selfie mode on Saturday. We're gonna be face-to-face, -face, um, not live, with, not next to each other. But anyhow, um, that's gonna be Saturday, and you can go to the website of, I believe, uh, Now Serving LA, and also Book Larder, and maybe Omnivore Books. I think all three bookstores are gonna be participating. Um, and that's gonna be a lot of fun. I love her. Um, I was a heel. Um, like Hemingway was, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Um, and I stood her up on our first meeting. So we've become good friends anyways. She has forgiven me and forgiveness is um, what we're all looking for in a person. So I love her, I love her book and that's gonna be on Saturday. Uh, next Monday, I have another special guest um, who's gonna be on Instagram Live with me. It's a return guest and um, they are going to make another, a different kind of daiquiri and one that I love. Uh, but I decided, I, I just watched the Hemingway special or the Hemingway biography. Uh, I should say hello to more people, sorry. Hello in Maine and, and in Brooklyn. Why would you want to be tracked? I don't, <laughs> I wanna hide. Um, hi from Cambridge. Where's Waldo? I don't know. The time changes all the time. Um, and actually I was thinking like nobody else um, announces their lives in advance. And I've had a couple of people, myself included, um, if Zoe's watching, hello Zoe, um, get the times wrong in all these different time zones because Europe changed its time a week after the US and everything got screwed up. 
So I'm trying to use, I use that little counter on my Instagram stories and you can go there and find out what time I'll be on in your neck of the woods, as we say. Um, if you're not a na uh, if you're not naked, if you're not a native English speaker and you want to know what neck of the woods uh, means, because often we throw, I have a friend who speaks amazing English and once I said, well, you know, sometimes we couch things in different um, words and she looked at me and she goes, what do you mean by couch things? So neck of the woods means where you are. So if you want to find out, you can just go to my Instagram stories and there's a little countdown thing you can set and it will tell you when everything's going to happen. Um, so... Uh, last week, um, I was in San Francisco visiting um, some friends who needed some assistance with things. Um, to be, very nice. And um, I'm glad all you tuned in and got to, or those of you that did tune in, um, Paul Einbund of The Morris showed us his Chartreuse collection, which was amazing. I could have gone four hours because he was his collection was outstanding. And then we went to St. George Distillery with Lance Winters. Um, but while I was there, I also watched the Hemingway biography on PBS by Ken Burns and Lynn Novick. And it was quite interesting. Um, I had a hard time with some of it because his life was not easy. We think of him as this literary figure who lived this rough and tumble life. He was macho. He went to bullfights. He lived in Paris. He lived in uh, Cuba. He drank a lot. Um, but as I saw it, I, he had some, you know, he was married four times. Um, each of his marriages um, ended up not so wonderfully, but he fell madly in love with these women. And I always, I was, as I was watching it, I kept wondering, like, he just, how do you fall madly in love with someone and then have the whole thing go to, um, go to heck? Um, and, you know, usually when you're in several relationships, you learn from one before and you bring it to the next one. And so you don't make the same mistakes and so forth. Uh, he, that didn't happen with him. Um, it was hard to watch some of the stuff because I was imagining what his life was like when the marriages started going sour, um, and also for the women he was with. Um, the other thing that I put this, I put him, I put this recipe, the Hemingway Dak, which I'm going to make on my blog today, yesterday, and I linked to it on Facebook. And yesterday there was a lot of heated discussion points about that. Um, some people were were mad that I mentioned that. I said, well, you know, he had he was a great writer, um, but he had his flaws. And somebody um, said, well, he was a great writer and had his flaws, and I don't care what you think. I was like, well, you just wrote what I thought. <laughs> so don't argue with people on the internet. That's my advice for today. But um, it was tough. Um, he had mental... Um, he had nine uh, concussions, and they were bad concussions. I had a concussion. I was in a car accident once, and I know that it was, um, it's very difficult to get that um, part of your memory back, and it's also difficult to exist. Things are different. You sort of feel like you're jet lagged for a couple of years. Um, if you're lucky, it doesn't last a long time. Um, he had nine, at least nine of them. Um, they didn't mention that too much in the, the biography. Um, but over the last few years, we've had discussions about do we, um, do we forgive people for, um, do we separate the artist from things they might have said that were um, racist or anti-Semitic or misogynist? Um, and it's, it's an interesting question, which I don't have the answer to. Um, however, a lot of people are very, um, you know, Hemingway is considered the you know, leading literary figure of the last century, um, one of the great writers. And it was very interesting to have different writers and literary historians that understand the history of writing and his history um, talk about it. So I do think it's very interesting to watch. Um, Hemingway lived in Paris, but not a really long time. And one of the great things about the biography was they showed, they had camera footage and photographs of, I think it was the 1920s when he was there. There's pictures of the cafes, um, a friend of mine who's a um, well-known director, she said to me, Ernest Hemingway is the most photographed American of all time. And I thought that was very, or mo most photographed man in America of all time, which I thought was very interesting. Um, he was very handsome. He was what you would say in French, is, was a personage. He was a personality. Uh, people apparently loved him. They loved going out drinking with him, meeting him. He was very good friends with people like Gertrude Stein, um, F. Scott Fitzgerald and so forth. So we knew all these um, diverse people 
Um, then he left France and he eventually moved to different countries. Um, he lived in Spain for about 20 years. And what was very interesting about the documentary is when he left his house there near the end of his life, he didn't realize he wasn't ever coming back. So he just shut the door behind him and locked the door and left, or maybe he didn't lock the door. Um, and there's a foundation there that, that ma maintains it, but they were like, it's all still intact. And this man who had the most incredible life that, you know, traveled around the world, he fought in wars, he, you know, he was in two airplane crashes in tw like 24 hours. Um, he ended up in Ketchum, Ohio, which is where he passed away. So um, he was famous for liking daiquiris, which he enjoyed a lot in Havana. He didn't love sugar. Someone mentioned he was a type um, one diabetic on one of my social media streams and I'm, I'm just gonna, I think he might have been a diabetic, um, but I was reading William Grimes' book on cocktails and he said that Hemingway would often drink 12 of them. And if you're sitting out in the sun drinking a fruity drink with rum in it, um, it's pretty easy to drink a few of them. I don't know if I could drink 12, but that might have explained some of the other things that were going on in his life. Um, I'm not gonna try to psychoanalyze um, Hemingway. I like reading comments. Hello in South Alabama, in Sonoma, in London, hello. This is so fun. <laughs> the ankle tracker, no, it's okay. Don't worry, I'm not in any trouble that I know of. Um, so he liked daiquiris, but apparently he didn't love the sugar. A daiquiri is made with lime juice, rum, and sugar syrup. So somehow this bar that he used to go to, La Floridita, which apparently is a very popular tourist destination nowadays, devised a, a daiquiri for him. It was called the Hemingway, now sort of evolved and be called the Hemingway daiquiri. It used to be served over crushed ice, and now it's not. It's sort of an up drink like a regular daiquiri. Um, ever since I posted the recipe for the daiquiri on my blog, a couple people said, oh, I don't like daiquiris, they're very sweet. Um, as Lance Winters mentioned at, the, at his distillery last weekend, a lot of, in the 60s and 70s and maybe in the 80s in America, a lot of cocktails were really sweet because people didn't like the taste of alcohol. The, the drinks were designed to hide alcohol. And I can say um, that's true from my college days. I had a lot of screwdrivers and Cape Cotters and White Russians, um, drinks that didn't necessarily feature alcohol as their primary flavor, which is probably a good thing because we used to buy the cheapest um, vodka we could buy. Um, and now I can still smell those drinks. They kind of smelled like a um, surgical waiting room. <laughs> it's like, like hand sanitizer, you're drinking it even though you don't drink hand sanitizer, please. So anyhow, um, tastes have changed. People now like uh, tartar drinks. So the Hemingway daiquiri has two, two citruses in it. One are grapefruits. And this is a grapefruit I just bought. And you can see it's a little punky. Um, I don't shy away from punky looking fruit. It's got some dents and bruises, um, but it's also flat. And a flat grapefruit means it's ripe. It's been on the tree a long time. Um, if you can touch the produce where you go and it's safe to do so, um, don't touch everything. Um, and when things get better, whatever, or wear a glove before you do it. Um, when you're buying the citrus, the heavier fruit is usually the best. Um, so if you can pick up several different oranges or grapefruit, go for the heaviest. Um, if you don't want to touch things and um, I agree, you're not supposed to touch all this stuff. Um, look, the grapefruit, you can see this one is flat. It's not round. And this is a pink grapefruit. It's very hard to find white grapefruits nowadays. Um, the other citrus it has are limes. And in America, mostly you find these, they're called Persian limes, and they're super green. Um, I actually specifically um, reached for these in the bin um, I didn't touch them all, I just touched the ones I wanted. Um, but limes are actually mostly yellow usually. If you go to a store that sells foods for Mexican cooking or Asian cooking, or if you go to those countries, often you'll see the limes are, are more on the pale yellow, yellowish side, uh, rather than super green like, like these are. And that's because these are gassed before they're ripe. 
which is why um, commercial limes are often really tart. If you go to the tropics, limes are um, sweeter and they're juicier. They do that because people want a green lime and they want to also make them last as long as possible and unripe fruit lasts longer because it has less, less moisture in it. And there's probably other, there are probably other reasons. Interestingly enough, <laughs> while I was thinking of this, there's another, there's a variety of lime called a Bears, B-E-A-R-S-S -S lime. And we used to get them at a restaurant I worked at. And because uh, everybody who works in a restaurant kitchen has the humor of a 12 year old, we used to call them bear ass limes. So uh, <laughs> they bear no relationship to bear backsides, but I always like, we always liked saying that it made us laugh, so. <laughs> All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and make this drink. And once, I, once again, I mentioned the recipe is on my blog. I just put it up yesterday, it's the Hemingway Daiquiri. F food tour. Hmm. Hello in Grand Central Station. The St. George dude was hot. <laughs> okay. Well, I have to say his wife is lovely too. They're both lovely people and we ended up having lunch with them and they were terrific. So that's who the package is from. They're sending me some coffee liqueur, which I didn't, didn't, couldn't take on the plane. So this drink has the two citrus. It has grapefruit and it has lime. Um, one of the things you can do to improve your, oh, it's right in front of me, <laughs> to improve all your cocktails and cooking is to use fresh food. Um, there's nothing worse than, um, than bottled lime juice. And I think that's also where people got this idea that daiquiris were sweet because people were using that Rose's lime juice, which is pre-sweetened. Um, I'm going to use this cocktail shaker. This was given to me by a very good friend in Paris, um, who is probably the best dressed person I know. And I believe in my book, uh, Drinking French, he's the first person pictured in it because I wanted to have somebody who was very well dressed. Um, in the book to give you an impression of Paris because he embodies that beautiful um, look of Paris with the, he's so well dressed, I can't stand it. Um, and his apartment is very chic as well, unlike mine. It's full of, mine's full of food and boxes and deliveries. So, but he gave me this beautiful cocktail shaker for my birthday a couple years ago, and it's small. It's a little tiny one. This is sort of a standard cocktail shaker, but if you were staying somewhere like at the Ritz in Paris, um, they probably, they might give you a cocktail in one of these. There is a Hemingway bar at the Ritz in Paris. I've never been. Cocktails, I think, are about 30 euros. And it's pretty small. You have to make a reservation. And they just haven't been. So that's on my agenda for some day. Um, this also has a built-in juicer with little hearts on it. So I'm not going to use it because I need to measure out the juice. And I'm just going to do it right in here. Okay, so I guess I could take that off. So the recipe, I have to write everything down. Uh, remember when we were in school when writing things down, you were cheating, it, like, it was, which is funny because I was an art history minor and we had to memorize all these dates. And now I'm like, who cares about all those dates? Why were they so important? You, they're all written down somewhere. It doesn't matter when Da Vinci painted a painting like the exact date, you don't need to memorize it. <laughs> Could tell I was not a great student. So the recipe has three quarters of an ounce of fresh lime juice. And this juicer is pretty cool. It's from uh, our friends at OXO. And one side's big and one side is smaller. The smaller one's good for limes. So I'm gonna go ahead. I don't have a counter to roll it on. I'm gonna roll, squeeze at the shoulder height because this table's high. This, this ankle bracelet's keeping me weighed down. <laughs> I did an online Pilates class the other day and the teacher said, okay, everyone put on your ankle bracelet, ankle weights. And I was like, who has ankle weights <laughs> lying around? Okay, so we want three quarters of an ounce of fresh lime juice. Needs just a little more. And while I've got the knife out, I'm gonna cut a little garnish for my, for the drink. 
That was too thin. <laughs> Okay, so I need just a little more. Perfect. So three quarters of an ounce of fresh lime juice and a half ounce of fresh grapefruit juice. So the Hemingway Margarita doesn't have sugar syrup in it, but it has maraschino liqueur or maraschino, depending. Um, most Americans are familiar with maraschino cherries, um, which are those red cherries in jars with stems that you put in drinks. Uh, maraschino, maraschino liqueur, my bottle is here. Um, it's a distillation of these little tiny wild cherries that grow in the Dalmatian, around the Dalmatian coast. I believe it's in, they're in Croatia, it probably says on the back. Um, and several Italian companies make maraschino. It's popular um, for making a, there's an Italian dessert called zuppa inglese, which is, which means English soup, which is sort of a layered cake, similar to a trifle, but the flavor is maraschino. And I used to have trouble finding this in Paris. Then I realized, go to the Italian markets. Don't go to the liquor stores because the liquor stores don't have it. Um, I actually went to a very good liquor store the first time I was looking for it, and I said, do you have maraschino? And they were like, what is that? And I was like, I can't believe you don't have maraschino because they had all these other liquors. Um, but it is um, necessary for the cocktail, the last word, uh, the Martinez cocktail, which is sort of a variation on the martini. And somebody brought this up to me on Twitter today or yesterday. They said they didn't know which one to get. And I hadn't tasted a lot of them side by side, so it's hard to say. Um, but somebody else left a comment, I think it was on my blog, saying they bought some maraschino and it smelled bad. And I was like, you know, if you smell it, it smells like cherries because it's distilled cherries with sugar added. And um, so to answer the person about the tasting of maraschinos or mar maraschino, maraschini, <laughs> I guess it's in Italian, um, I found an article on thekitchen.com and they, they listed the flavors of three different maraschinos or maraschini. And one of, they described one of them as f really funky. And I was like, okay, that's not part of the vocabulary I know of maraschino, but it's a lovely thing in a drink. It adds a sort of almond background flavor. You don't use a lot of it. This drink only has a half an ounce. So I'm hoping this will all fit in this little shaker or I'm gonna be embarrassed. And lastly, two ounces of rum. And Hemingway, I guess, liked Bacardi rum, which was very popular in Cuba at the time. It probably still is. Um, I've never been to Cuba and I'd like to go. And I also read that Bacardi, the rum used to be a lot stronger. This is just whatever, 40% alcohol or 80 proof. Okay, did I add it? No. <laughs> I'd never be a good bartender. So there we have it. So this is pretty tiny. Um, I'm, gonna, I'm thinking I'm gonna put it in the big shaker. Um, with apologies to my lovely friend who gave me this mini one, because there's not enough room for the ice in it. But it's beautiful to look at. And I shall move this. And then I'm going to fill the shaker with ice. So it's interesting, I was talking to a bartender the other day about shaking cocktails, because some recipes say to shake them for 30 seconds, some say 15 seconds, um, or stirring them. And it was funny because we were saying, well, it depends how 
fast people shake things. If they do it slowly, it's gonna take a little longer. So shake it until it's cold. And you can tell a cocktail's cold in a shaker when it's cold, the outside is cold, um, it's frosty. Um, but shaking also dilutes a cocktail. People get scared of the word dilution. I actually sometimes shake gin um, martinis. They'll go, no, you're gonna dilute it. I'm like, that's the whole idea of adding, I, even when you stir it, you're diluting it. All right. So this is the Hemingway martini, the Hemingway daiquiri. <laughs> I've got martinis on the brain. This you go. And I'm gonna garnish this with a fresh lime wheel, which you could either float on top, actually I'm gonna put it on the side so it looks a little more festive. My guest on Monday is a professional bartender and bar owner. So they will show us um, a fancy way of garnishing a drink maybe. So the Hemingway daiquiri. Um, it's good because it's fruity. Um, there's lots of grapefruit, a lot of citrus in it. It's very acidic. Um, and I mean that in a good way, like lemonade is acidic. It's not a sweet daiquiri. Um, I couldn't drink a dozen of them, but I could drink one and maybe two. But it makes a fairly hefty drink, as you can see. And it's pretty. So now that it's summer or spring, whatever, if you can look see outside. Mm. Nikki, the, the IG with Paul sent you on a VEP search. Yes, to get that fancy chartreuse. Um, this is a really good question because when I had Alexander Gabriel, um, who is a rum distiller or rum maker in France, he buys the rum often from Caribbean islands and he finishes it in Cognac where he lives. Um, he used um, Stiggins rum, which is one of their rums that's infused with Victoria pineapples. So you could use a light rum. Um, it wouldn't be the official uh, Hemingway daiquiri. I wouldn't use a dark rum because the color won't be so pretty, but light rum sort of allows the citrus flavors to come through nicely in the drink. So um, I don't usually have white rum lying around, um, but a light amber rum would work as well. There's another question. Uh, do I have a favorite pastis? Uh, no, I just actually started enjoying pastis. When I had Apollonia Poilin on as a guest from Poilin Bakery, her uh, partner it used to be a bartender and he goes, you know what, try it with cold sparkling water, which of course is like in, en terre d in French. You cannot, you know, no, absolutely not. You have to add regular water. Um, but it was so much better with sparkling water. It was more like an interesting drink. So I don't really have a favorite brand. I know, uh, you know, Pernod, uh, I've, that's what I have at home is Pernod. Um, but I'm not a huge anise liquor drinker, so I don't drink a lot of it, so I don't buy it. Um, but I have friends that do drink it. Yes, the stackery is spot on, Kelly. Have I tried the Chambéry Cassis? I have never heard of Chambéry Cassis. Hemingway references in the A Table. Huh. I do not know. Um, I've never, I know that now in New York there is a, um, a, some people who are making cassis, creme de cassis, it's called current cassis. And um, I haven't tasted it yet. But I didn't know Chambéry is known for its vermouth. So usually cassis is associated with Burgundy, which is a different region. So, mm. It's delicious. Um, it's very uh, bold, I would say. It's very... Um, fruity, you do taste the rum, but the citrus is very, um, it's, it's very illuminating, I should say. This is why Hemingway is the great writer. I'm trying to think of words, adjectives to describe a drink. Mm. But it is delicious. And it was funny because I was scrambling for something to eat with this. I was like, what can I eat? Yes, a black currants were banned in the U.S. for a while because they carried a white pine disease, I think it was called, but now they're back, they're okay. Um, the problem is there's not a big market for currants in the United States. So 
um, maybe that will change. So I got these at a food event once, and these are cashews with the skins still on, and they look like regular cashews. I just opened them. Um, they're from India, and the company is called Karma, and they didn't pay me to say any of this or use them, but they're made with lime juice and an onion and sea salt. And the skin is kind of interesting. It's a little crackly on them. Mm. I like them. They go good with the drink. Mm. Yes, there is a market for current red currants. Um, somebody mentioned if you're a jam maker, because they make really good jam. And they make really good, this is dessert called summer pudding. So you can probably find them at uh, farmer's markets. We used to get them in the States when I cooked in restaurants, um, but you won't. Maybe you, you know you have to kind of look for them. Okay, this is another question I've been getting. Um, if you can't get maraschino, um, you know the whole question of substituting ingredients in cocktails is always very interesting because basically anything can be substituted but becomes a different drink. Like this drink, you could actually use gin if you don't have. Rum, it wouldn't be a daiquiri, it would be something else. So feel free to substitute anything you want in a cocktail. Um, you might have to change the name if you're serving it to people. But that's how a lot of cocktails are invented. The Rob Roy swaps out um, whiskey for scotch whiskey, for blended scotch whiskey, substitutes rye or bourbon with scotch. And it's sort of the same, you know, it's the same drink, but it's just substituting. So you can substitute. Um, the closest I would say is to use kirsch and add a little bit of sugar syrup to it or a touch of agave um, just because you need some sugar in the drink to balance the acidity and kirsch doesn't have the that any of that sweetness in it. It's very alcohol forward, I should say. Um, so I would add maybe a teaspoon of agave or sugar to the drink or sugar syrup. You'll have to play around with it. How does the ice stay in the bottle? I'm not sure what bottle you're referring to, so I can't answer that. Ice in the bottle. Anyway, so that is the Hemingway Daiquiri. Uh, next Monday, please tune in because I'll be having one of my all-time favorite people. Um, if they are watching, um, I will look forward to seeing you on Monday, but I will be also be online on um, Saturday with my friend Reem Cassis. I pronounced her name in like French, Cassis. Uh, even though she's Palestinian. Um, she wrote this wonderful book, The Arabesque Table, and we're gonna talk about it. We're gonna be talking about cooking, uh, making foods from that region of the world, um, why we use the term, why she uses the term arabesque rather than Middle Eastern. Um, there's gonna be some very lively discussion. Um, we have a very open relationship and a lot of things um, we're gonna get to talk about because um, it's nice to discuss things with people who are um, as wonderful as her and a really good cook, and I love this book. So that'll be on Saturday. You can go to the um, Book Larder, uh, Book Larder, <laughs> I sort of choked on my words, uh, page and go to their website. I just actually just put a link to it on my Instagram stories today. It's free, free. So you can, that's free. And then Monday's gonna be free as well. So cheers, everybody. Mmm. Mmm. Thanks. I like reading all the comments, except the ones in languages I don't understand. <laughs> Once these people were saying, you need to do this in French. I'm like, well, I can do that when Roman's around. Okay. First time watcher. Oh, welcome. Don't make it the last. <laughs> okay. All right. Take care, um, I will see you this week. Uh, this is the Hemingway Daiquiri. Yeah, the recipe is on my blog, um, davidlebovitz.com. You can go get it right now if you want. Um, I also link to it in the post I wrote about, um, I put up today on Instagram. So cheers. I'm actually finishing the drink live, which I, usually I try to be a 
a little more temperate. Um, thank you so much for joining. I missed you. Um, I was in San Francisco and I did a couple of lives, but I didn't get a chance to chat and read comments and so forth. So um, I'm going to cry in a few minutes. Um, thinking about how much I missed you all. So thank you so much for tuning in. Um, hope to see you soon and have a good weekend. Okay, bye-bye. <laughs> I'm going to finish my drink. Bye-bye.